That's enough. I'm Dave Stevens. For any of you that don't know me, I'm McDavid's plant manager, and let me welcome you to McDavid Facilities 2002 Winning Everyday Celebration! <laughs> you know, as Americans, we have some unique privileges. And let's kick this thing off right. Please join me and stand while the band plays our national anthem. of the South Carolina Game Clocks, Coach Lou Holtz. I, uh, that, uh, for those of you who may not be aware of it, that is the opening of how we come out on the field. And I couldn't help but sit there and marvel at just your rhythm and your beauty and how you play in accordance. And I couldn't help but think that our athletes think they're such great athletes, and I can't get 11 of them to get off on the count, but to watch everybody play their instruments. And I appreciate the cheerleaders being here, and I just more or less... I'm delighted to be here. Understand who Lou Holtz is not. I'm not a singer, I'm not a dancer, I'm not an entertainer, I'm not an intellect. I graduated from high school, I was in the lower half of my high school class. If it was not for people like me, there could have been no upper half of the class. And I wasn't a good athlete. Every story I tell you is true. When Tim Brown won the Heisman, I went to New York to be with him in the event he didn't win it. Because, see, once he won it, I didn't need to be there, but I needed to be there to support him if he didn't win it. It was shown live on CBS television, and Jim Nance came over to me during commercial. He said, Lou, do you mind if we interview you? We have a little extra time. I said, no, that'd be fine. He turned on the TV late, and the first question he asked me, he said, Lou Holtz, did you ever dream about winning the Heisman? I said, all the time, Jim. I always dreamt about winning the Heisman for three reasons. I've been the first player from Kent State to ever win it. I've been the first defensive player to ever win it. 
and I've been the first third teamer to ever win it. And he said, well, we're going to move on, and the interview ended very abruptly. So I, I wasn't a good athlete. I'm not very talented in many reasons, but I'm delighted to be here. Understand why Lou Holtz is here. I'm not here because of money. I'm not here as a hired gun. A couple of years ago, I was asked to speak to international papers people. And I met George and so many other people, and I was so impressed with the company. And I listened to a manager get up and hadn't even graduated from college, and he talked about how he turned a plant from an unsuccessful one to a successful one. And he talked about such basic things, and I incorporated many of those things and took them back with me and used them at the University of South Carolina to turn the program around. So when they asked me would I be involved, I said I'd be proud to be involved with international paper. Why am I here? Because they said this plant is important. Type P. That's why I'm here. I said, well, tell me about it. I said, you got good people. They're rather new. They work hard. They've done some fine things. But I'm not here to preach to your lecture to you. I'm here because what you do is important, IP. I know you have problems. I got problems. You want to talk about problems? Tennessee, Georgia, Florida, <laughs> Alabama, Arkansas. Gee, Manelli, I, I worry. Somebody said, how do you sleep with you? Look, that's good. I said, like a baby. I wake up every two hours and cry. I think, oh. <laughs> And when I left Notre Dame, I never thought I'd coach again. Where do you go from Notre Dame, according to my mother, except directly to heaven and you sit by the Pope? You don't coach anymore. And I went and did TV. TV's not complicated. You just talk to you, think of something to say. And then I went to live in a town where the average age was deceased. And when you get up in the morning, you got problems, you got obstacles, you got difficulties, get down on your knees and thank God. Because that's what life's all about. Having somebody need you, have somebody count on you. And that's a great thing about athletics, that's a great thing about a business, that's a great thing about IP. Because we all need one another. See, you're never going to have it made. You're never going to reach a point where you crop up your feet and say, hey, no more problems. If there was ever an individual that had it made, was a multi-millionaire, movie star, TV star. Home in Beverly Hills, one in Nantucket, Rhode Island. Boy, he had it made. Movie star, millionaire, named John Belushi. Died of a drug overdose. On the other hand, you always have hope. I don't care how destitute you are. I don't care how difficult you are. You have hope. For as every individual had no hope was a musician. His music was a little different. People didn't like it. His girlfriend left him. He got a gun. He was going to commit suicide. And he stopped and said, no, there's got to be more to life. His name was Billy Joel, today one of the more accepted entertainers. No matter how great things are, you never have it made, but no matter how destitute you are, you always have hope. I'm not here to preach to you or lecture to you. I'm here to talk to myself because we face a difficult challenge this year. You know, there are a lot of things in this world I don't understand. I don't understand how a black cow eats green grass and gives off white milk and yellow cheese. I don't know. <laughs> I've never been able to understand why a kamikaze pilot wore a headgear. <laughs> I don't understand how you can take oxygen and hydrogen, both are motorless, colorless, and tasteless, and combine it with black, tasteless carbon and produce white, sweet sugar. In the human heart, four inches in length, six inches in diameter, beats 70 times a minute, 4,200 times an hour. 100,800 times a day, 36,792,000 times a year, 2,575,440,000 times in a lifetime. And every time that little sucker beats, it pumps 2.5 ounces of blood, every beat, 175 ounces a minute, 82 gallons an hour, 1,968 <laughs> gallons a year. See, I don't understand that, but I'll tell you what I really don't understand. I don't understand how some people born with so much achieve so little. And some people born with so little achieve so much. Recently I spoke to the University of South Carolina's commencement, wonderful experience. But then five days later I went up and I spoke to the graduation ceremonies for the deaf, blind, and handicapped. How lucky we are. 
to have the obstacles, to have the opportunities, to have the talent, to have the ability. Boy, when I think about our schedule, and then I think, boy, how lucky I am to be healthy and to have an opportunity and to make a difference in people's lives. You know what I want to share with you is just five basic points. First of all, how delighted I am to see the spouses here. If you want some great advice, listen to your spouse. Nobody knows you any better. Nobody loves you anymore. Nobody wants to see you succeed anymore. Nobody will be more honest with you. And they've got to be intelligent because they picked you. <laughs> and I mean that sincerely. My wife's not only somebody I love dearly. She's my very best friend. And when I talk about my wife, I immediately think when I coached Ohio State under Woody Hayes. We won the national championship, and I'll never forget, they had a big billboard sign at the entrance to the airport that said, behind every successful person stands a very surprised mother-in-law. <laughs> and boy, I know that's true in my case. But in, in any event, it says, but there are five things I really believe that are going to determine our success and yours. The first one is attitude, and attitude's a choice. God gave you the power to love, to think, to imagine, to create, to plan, but the greatest power you have is the power to choose. You choose whether you're going to act or procrastinate, believe or doubt, prayer, curse, help, or help. You choose whether you're going to succeed or fail. You're going to choose the future of this mill. I'm going to choose the future of South Carolina. It's all about the choice you make on attitude. And he didn't found in a job. Every story I tell you is absolutely true. Many, many years ago, I signed a five-year contract to go to the New York Jets to coach Joe Namath. The best job in America, the New York Jets. And I went there with a negative attitude. I went there thinking, I'm not sure this is what I want to do. Didn't want to move my family. Didn't want to go from North Carolina. Didn't want to go and live in a big city where the police had an unlisted phone number. <laughs> but I went there with a negative attitude. The best job in America. And that's miserable. And after eight months, I left. The best job in America. Why? Not because of New York Jets, because of me. Every time there was a problem, I would start bitching and moaning and complaining and saying, I didn't think it would work out, and blame everybody else when the fault was me. I don't care what job you have. You aren't going to be happy. You aren't going to be successful unless you have the right attitude. On the other hand, several years ago, they asked me to go to the University of Minnesota. Now, I want to tell you, I don't know if you've ever been to Minnesota. I've met three people my entire life from Minnesota. They all had blonde hair and blue ears, so I, I didn't want to go up there. <laughs> they lost 17 straight games. Every score they lost by was 47 to 13. They offered a job to five different people, including three assistant coaches. One didn't even have a job. All five turned the job down. And Harvey McKay said to me, but Lou Holtz, there's potential here. I said, what do you mean? He said, last year, Nebraska only beat us by 10. <laughs> well, Nebraska has a good program. That impressed me. I didn't know he meant 10 touchdowns. <laughs> Nebraska beat him 84 to 13, Ohio State 76 10. And I went there. But it's one of the great experiences I've had. Minnesota's a marvelous place to live, even though the state bird is a mosquito. <laughs> and we were happy there, and we were successful there. In our second year, we went to a bowl game. Here's what I say to you the New York Jets, Joe Namath, a wonderful individual. The best job in America and has miserable and unhappy. Why? Attitude. Minnesota, a job nobody wanted. But I went there with the proper attitude and were successful and turned out to be a marvelous experience. What's her attitude going to be towards adversity? Let me tell you what happened my first year in South Carolina. My wife had her second major cancer surgery. They gave her 10% chance to live. I don't pray for my wife anymore. I pray to her. She's a saint and she's doing well. And I almost lost my son Skip. Had a rare illness. Five days he was in intensive care. And on the Friday before we played Florida, man's most prized possession is mother. My mother died the Friday before we played Florida. And I was on a school airplane for four straight days. And I was going to be on it two more days. We landed at Lady Island Airport and the pilot said, Coach, well, you're visiting the athlete. We're going to fly 11 miles to Hilton Head to get gas. We'll come back and get you. During that 11-mile flight, that plane crashed. One pilot was killed, and the other one seriously injured. We lost every football game we played that year. We were 0-11. And, 
And I had a kicker that said, I can't kick when you're watching. <laughs> and I explained to him, my contract said I had to be at the game. <laughs> all that happened my first year. Now, we were all in 11. But records can be deceiving. We really weren't as good as a record that lead you to believe. <laughs> As I said to our football team after the 0-11 season, we have two choices. Either pick ourselves up or stay down because nobody's going to pick us up. Florida isn't going to call and say, Coach, you don't have a quarterback, boy, is he bad. But, Coach, we got three of them. Let me send you one this year <laughs> to help you out. Don't expect Wayhouse or anybody else to help you out. Ladies and gentlemen, it's up to us. The attitude we choose of what's going to happen when we have adversity, we're going to get knocked down. I've been on bottom, I've been on top, I'll be both places again. But I can tell you this, the more difficult this situation when you get knocked down, pick yourself up. Because that's the only option you have. I had a young man up there by the name of Ryan Brewer. I could talk to you about Jerome Bettis, Tony Rice, or Ryan Brewer. As I told you every story, I tell you true. I get in South Carolina, I get a phone calls from Ryan Brewer. He said, Coach, I always wanted to play for you. And I said, well, tell me about yourself, Ryan Brewer. He said, I'm a high school football player in Ohio. I'm 5'10", 185 pounds. I'm an A student, and I made all state in Ohio. I said, Ryan, is that true? If that's true, we're going to offer you a scholarship. I said, we're going to recruit you. He said, does that mean a scholarship? I said, yeah. He said, then I accept. I said, whoa, I hadn't even saw him, but I said, fine, you know, we offer. I said, who else offered you a scholarship, Ryan? He said, nobody. <laughs> he didn't have a scholarship offer. He recruited me. He schluckered me. <laughs> so I hung up the phone. I called one of these recruiting experts. I said, can Ryan Brewer play? He said, coach, he couldn't play a dead Indian in a Western movie. <laughs> then he showed up, and I watched him run. Man, was he slow. My initial reaction was if he got in a race with a pregnant lady, he'd finished third. <laughs> but he had a marvelous attitude. <laughs> Eighteen months later, we play Ohio State in a bowl game. The school that never wanted him, he rushed for 100 yards, cut passes for over 100 yards, scored three touchdowns, was the most valuable player. See, ladies and gentlemen, don't tell me about anything but their attitude. And I visited many of the people in the plant day, and I gotta tell you, I was impressed. I was impressed with your plant, and I was impressed with the people I had a chance to visit. You people got a lot of talent, you got a lot of training. I'm not sure I can watch all those different screens. I can just focus in on one, but, you know, ladies and gentlemen, we are blessed. An attitude so critical. Don't let what other people say affect our attitude. You know, a few years ago, we took Notre Dame down to Florida down to the Sugar Bowl to play Florida in the Sugar Bowl. You coached by Steve Perry. Remember that game? We were a big underdog. But I felt we'd win. We had a good fullback named Jerome Bettis. And we had a good football team. And I sent our team home for two days for Christmas. And I took my wife and my four children. We went to Orlando. We went out to dinner. I'm never happier when I'm out to dinner with my family. My wife and I. Next Monday, we'll celebrate our 41st wedding anniversary. And I said to her, I don't think it's going to last another 41 years, you know, maybe 38. But anyway, man, we're out to dinner. I'm in a great mood. And the waiter came up and he recognized me. He said, we're right there in Orlando. He said, hey, you're Lou Holtz, head coach of Notre Dame, aren't you? I said, yes, sir. And I took out my pen. I just like his, thinking he wanted an autograph. And he said, let me ask you a question. I said, yeah. He said, what's the difference between Notre Dame and Cheerios? I said, gee, I don't have a clue. He said, Cheerios belong in a bowl, Notre Dame doesn't. <laughs> this is a waiter. I don't know the sucker from the man in the moon, but all of a sudden my attitude changed. <laughs> and I was in a bad mood. A few minutes later, I called him over and I said, come here. I said, let me ask you a question. I said, what's the difference between Lou Holtz and a golf pro? He said, I don't know. I said, a golf pro gives tips. You know what she found out when the evening was over. But I couldn't let an individual ruin an evening with the people I love and cherish the most. But I did. And if you'll remember, after that game, we won the bowl game. First thing the newspaper said to me, what are you going to do? And I said, I'm going to go back and look up that sucker who told me <laughs> Cheerios belong in the bowl Notre Dame. Does it? We used that as a motivation rather than ruin an evening. Jerome Bettis, the bus. 
Joan Bettis played for him in Notre Dame. He left Notre Dame his rookie of the year for the Rams. First round draft pick. Rookie of the year. Second year wasn't very good. Third year was a disaster. And the average age in the NFL for running backs, 4.2 years. And it had already played three. And we had an open date, and I watched the Rams play, and he played poorly. I called him on Monday. I said, Jerome, I saw the game. He said, what would you think? I said, that's why I'm calling you. I said, Jerome, you may not know this. But I've observed this game. And there's somebody impersonating you. I'm sure of it. They're wearing your jersey, your number, and giving you a bad reputation. And you got to find out who that sucker is impersonating you and get a change because he's going to hurt you. And hung the phone up. That's all I wanted to say. It was a new conversation. As soon as the season was over, Jerome was in my office. He said, Coach, I thought about that conversation. He said, when I left Notre Dame, I had a wonderful attitude. And he said, I got with the wrong people that had a negative attitude. And he said, it affected my performance. He said, I'm going to spend the next five months at Notre Dame, which he did, and get my attitude right. And during that five months, the Pittsburgh Steelers traded for him. Now he's a bus. Same talent, different attitude. The second thing I think is absolutely critical, you have to have a passion to win. I don't ask our players how many want to win when the band's playing, the crowd's cheering, the TV lights are on. The question I ask, can you live with losing? Can you live with failure? Can you live with mediocrity? See, ladies and gentlemen, to me, a passion means two things. One, it means sacrifice. There's no way in this world that this is going to be the number one plan or meal without sacrifice. I'm married to a lovely wife because we sacrifice. Our football team's got to make sacrifice or we aren't going to win this year. My first year in South Carolina, every time I told the players something, they thought it was a suggestion. You know, block that guy. Well, let me think about that. <laughs> Get back to you tomorrow. Go to class, that's punishment unless you want to graduate. Lift weights, that's punishment unless you want to win. I admire people that make a sacrifice. I was on an elevator not long ago, six o'clock in the morning, this cute young lady gets on, she has on her jogging outfit. Now one of these crazy people talk on the elevator, I said, how far are you going to run today? She said, six miles. I said, wow, I don't even drive that far. She said, do you jog? I said, oh, no, I want to be sick when I die. <laughs> but I admire people that make the sacrifice. You know, ladies and gentlemen, sacrifice also fundamentals. I don't know why it is, but players get bored with fundamentals. A great football team can block and tackle. Steve Spurrier did a great job up at Florida. His teams were well coached. Bobby Bowden does a great job at Florida State. The team's always well coached, well talented. But it goes back to fundamentals, being able to block and tackle. I tell our football team this story every fall. They get bored with it, but it points. Don't forget fundamentals. Don't get bored with doing little things. You know, like maintenance. You know, you have to do the maintenance on those various machines. I don't know how you do it. But that's fundamental to success. Cleaning the machine off, I think, would be fundamental. That guy walked in a pet shop, wanted to buy a bird, and had all these birds for $1.95. The guy's looking at the birds. He said, sir, you don't want that bird? I got the ideal bird for you. The bird you want's over here, and I said, I got it for you on sale for $612. Okay, guy said, well, that bird looks like the other birds. He said, this bird talks or sings. That bird doesn't do anything. The guy said, gee, it's a lot of money, but I'm all alone. He bought the bird. Came in the next day, said, I paid $612 for that bird. You told me to talk or sing. That sucker doesn't talk or sing. The guy said, what did the bird do when he rang the bell? He said, what bell? He said, didn't you buy the bell where the bird could get the proper tune? He said, no, I didn't know I needed a bell. Bird ain't going to talk or sing unless you buy the bell, and the bell's only $11. Guy buys the bell, come in the next day, he said, the bird don't talk or sing, and he rang the gun dog bell. And the owner said, sir, that's impossible. He said, I have the same type of bird as you. Well, just this morning, my bird got up, rang that little bell, ran up and down that ladder, and the guy said, what ladder? He said, didn't you buy the ladder where the bird can exercise? And, no, I didn't know I need the ladder. Bird ain't going to talk or sing unless you buy the ladder, and the ladder's only $16. This goes on four days. Every day he sells a guy something. Guy comes in the fifth day and said, I have $727 invested in that bird. And today the bird finally talked to me just before he died. 
He said, Bird got up this morning, rang that little bell, ran up down that letter, swung on the swing, looked in the mirror, all the things you sold me. And just before he died, he looked over at me, he said, didn't he sell you any bird seed? <laughs> see, see, we forget the obvious. And sacrifice is part of fundamental. The other thing about passion to win. Get rid of all the excuses why you can't. When I went to the University of South Carolina, people say you can't win. The schedule's too tough. It goes on and on. See, ladies and gentlemen, get rid of the excuses. You can always find a hundred different reasons why you can't do something. But let me tell you what happened. When you start looking for reasons why you can't do something, you never bother to find reasons why you can't. I look up here at the Arkansas Hogs, 1977, my first year there. We went 10 and 1. We went to the Orange Bowl. We're going to play Oklahoma, number one in the country. And I had to suspend three athletes, scored 78% of our touchdowns. And we were a big underdog, and everybody thought we'd get beat. 24 point underdog. And if you watched our team practice, you would have said they're going to get beat by 40. They were going through the motions. They were a defeated team. There was no leadership. There was no positive. They were going to get beat. And I had a team meeting three days before the game. And they walked in. They weren't like you. I congratulate you on your attitude. You're positive. You're beat. You look at me. Our football team just knew they were going to get beat. And they walked in. They wouldn't look at me. wouldn't talk to one another. Sat down. And I said to them, I know all the reasons why we can't win. I read about them in the paper every day. I read how great the players are from Oklahoma and how great the players are from Arkansas that aren't going to play. But I've never read one positive comment about anybody that's going to play. So I know all the reasons why we can't win. Tell me why we can. Nobody said anything. I said, surely there's a reason why we can win. Finally, one player said, Coach, we have the number one defense in the country, statistically, which we did. And he said, so we aren't going to get beat as bad as people think. <laughs> well, it wasn't really what I wanted, but it, it was a step in the right direction. And then the more they thought about it, one guy pointed out we had a great offensive line, and we had a great competitor quarterback, and we had a great punter and a great place kicker. I wanted them to say they had a great coach. That never came up. <laughs> But when they got done pointing out why we could win when they left that room, they were a different team. Instead of focusing on why we couldn't do something, they focused on why we could. We beat them 31 to 6. And a young man named Roland Sales had never gained 100 yards in a game, gained rushed for 205 yards in that game. Not, not, not because of me. It's it just get rid of the excuses and start looking for reasons why we can do something. And the third reason out of five that I think is critical to your future and mine. Let's understand what we're trying to do. It's not complicated. I went to school predominantly to eat my lunch. I, I'm not very smart, but I have common sense. It was obvious to me in the seventh grade. I had a nun named Sister Mary Harriet. She didn't like me. passed out a test. I didn't know a single answer. I started looking around out of boredom. Because I was done with my test, and, I'm, and she hollered in front of the whole class, Lou Holtz, don't you even think about cheating? And she comes storming back here. She said, if I even suspect you of cheating, I'm taking 10% off your grade. And I got out the textbook, and I said, 90 sounds good to me. It really did. <laughs> she didn't think that was particularly funny, but <laughs> what are you trying to do? You're not running a mill. You're not doing anything. All you're trying to do is satisfy the needs of the customers. That's all you're doing. That's all business is. All you're trying to do is help the customers get what they want. Why is it important for the quality of wood that comes off there? Why is that important? Because much of the wood you use is used as studs in a house or the A-frame, and it's got to be good. And they want it on time, and they want it consistent. And the machine has to continue to run. All you're trying to do, you're not running a plant, you're not running a mill, you're trying to help people get what they want. All I'm trying to do is graduate and win. Every decision I make, how can I graduate and how can I win? Do you realize in 1930, people were so busy running the railroad? Their job was not to run the railroad. They went bankrupt running the railroad. Their job was to transport people from one location to the other. And they said, how can we transport people better 
they would today have the New Haven Airlines, the Pennsylvania Airlines. That's like I asked many of you today, I said, what would you change? Somebody had a brilliant idea. He said, I put a covering over the mill there because when it rains, it fouls up the computer. He's thinking, what do the customers want? How can you help the customers get a better than anybody else can? See, it's like the guy was working for a railroad and, and, and the train came by and they had the president of the train off and he stopped there and the guy said, hey, John. And John happened to be the president and the guy who was laying the rail so I can't believe that's you, John. John come down off and they visited for a while and then John got back on the train, the president left and the other guy said, you know him? He said, yeah. He said, we start working together. He said, you start working together? He said, yeah. He said, but today he's the president of the railroad. He said, yeah. See, John went to work for the railroad. He said, I went to work for $1.25 an hour. It was many years ago. See, ladies and gentlemen, what are we trying to do? Help the customers get what they want. That's why it's important that we understand what the customers want because if you take the top Fortune 500 today, compare with the top Fortune 500 50 years ago, there aren't many on the same list. Why? People's needs change. And people don't change to meet the needs of the people. You know, I almost didn't go into coaching. I almost owned my own business. I do own a business. I own a colleague of dealership in Tallahassee because I always wanted to own my own business. And you know what? You win there like anything else, help the customers get what they want. But I was in the Army. I was in Fort Knox, Kentucky, and I'll never forget. I came out on a weekend pass. I'm driving into Louisville on Dixie Highway, and I saw this restaurant with a golden arches called McDonald's. I'd never seen it before. 1959, hamburger, 10 cents, fries, 10, Coke, 10. For 35 cents, I could get along. I stopped, and you didn't have a sit-in. They didn't have drive-in. You walked, parked in a restaurant, parked in the lot, walked up to the counter, and got your food, went back to the car, and ate it. I'd never seen anything like it. McDonald's, 1959. I'll never forget. I'm sitting there, and I said, boy, this is good. I've never seen anything like it. It's cheap. It's hot. It's fresh. Man, this is going to be good. So I decided I was going to open up a McDonald's restaurant. You know why I did because I'm driving down the parking lot and up underneath McDonald's I saw a sign that discouraged me. The sign said over one million sold. And I said, it's too late. Boy, should I get in on that ground floor? But no, that's <laughs> a million. That's now 600 billion or something. See, because I should have known that's what people wanted. Why is IP successful? Because you help people get what they want. And that's all we're doing. We're not running a machine. We're not running a plant. We're not running a mill. We're not doing anything. What we're trying to do, help the customers get what they want. And customers' needs change. And don't fight change. You're going to go through change. Man, people don't like to change. I've had to make a lot of changes. I had to change our offense after I left Notre Dame. When I was at Notre Dame, I'd never throw the ball. I wouldn't even have a passing gear in my car. And all of a sudden, I go to South Carolina, and we can't run the ball. We've got to pass, got to change. I don't like it, but why do we have to change? We have to change to win. And that was my purpose, winning graduate. We moved our study hall out of the classroom into the library. Why? Because where do the girls go study the library? Where do the smart students go to the library? Our grade point average has gone from a 2.05 to 2.7. We graduated 21 out of 22 seniors last year because every decision we made was how can we graduate? How can we win? Don't fight change. Do you realize in 1878 they invented the typewriter? But the problem they had with the typewriter, they weren't going to sell any because if you typed real fast, the key stuck. And they said, how can we keep the keys from sticking? Because if we don't keep the keys from sticking, we ain't going to sell a typewriter. So they put together a committee. The committee got together and came up with a brilliant solution. They came back and they said, the only way we can keep the keys from sticking is if we hide the letters on the keypad. The guy said, what do you mean? He said, we'll put A up here, we'll hide B down here, we'll stick C up here, they'll never think of looking for a D down there. Didn't you wonder why the letters on the keypad are screwed up? That's so you couldn't type fast. You had to hunt. Now, why in the world would they put R up there? <laughs> Today, no matter how fast you type, the keys won't stick. If you try to change a keypad, so don't change that, because I know that. We never want to go from the known to the unknown, but don't be afraid of change. But always keep in mind one thing. You have a mission. 
to help the customers get what they want. Why did they build this plant? Because there was a need for the customers. That's all. And the fourth point, be a dreamer. Look at me. What do you see when you look at me? People stop me in the airport all the time, say, I know you, and I say, no, you don't. I'm not who you think you are. I'm not Robert Redford. <laughs> no, they, they, that's funny. I, but I'm 5'10", 152 pounds, wear glasses, speak with a lisp, have a physique, it appears like I've been inflicted with very, very scurvy most of my life. <laughs> but I'll tell you what I think is important is to be a dreamer. If I could wish on one thing on you was to be a dreamer. Martin Luther King made one of the ten greatest speeches in the history of mankind, voted on. He changed this country for the better. Where he made a speech, he said, I have a dream. Hey, gentlemen, dreams make things happen. Be a dreamer. Don't just go through life. Martin Luther King said, I have a dream. Do you think it would have had the same effect that he stood up and said, I got a strategic plan I want to talk to you about. <laughs> See, people follow dreams. And in 1966, I'm go to South Carolina as an assistant coach. My wife's eight months pregnant with our third child. We spent every cent we had in the bank for a down payment on a home. I'm there one month, and I pick up the paper, and the headlines of the paper read, Marvin Bass resigns. I said to my wife, I wonder if he's related to my coach. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I'm unemployed. They hired Paul Dietzel. I don't know Paul Dietzel. He doesn't retain me. I don't know anybody in South Carolina. They don't recommend me. And I'm unemployed. My wife has to go to work. I'm a stay-at-home dad. Felt defeated. No enthusiasm. See, if you don't have a burning desire to do something, you'll have no enthusiasm. And that's the way I was, defeated. My wife bought me a book, and he talked about having goals. And I had a lot of time, so he broke it down to five categories. Things I wanted to accomplish as a husband and a father. My wife and I have been married 41 years. All four of our children have graduated from college. And I want to say this to every father. The best advice I ever received was when our first child was born. A man told me, he said, the best thing you can do as a father for that child is always show that child how much you love their mother. It'll give them a security, it'll give them a peace. But there were things I wanted to do as a husband and father, and things I want to do religiously. God is so important in my life. I don't preach it. I don't lecture it. But I hope the way I live my life reflects the strong faith I have in our Lord. Then things I want to accomplish financially, and then things I want to accomplish professionally. I want to coach at Notre Dame. I want to win the national championship. I want to be coach of the year, and I'm writing them down. And then the last category was things I want to do for excitement. You know, I'm sitting there, I thought, what would I do? I'd jump out of an airplane. What would that be like? Did you ever think about that? That'd be fine. I wanted to land on an aircraft carrier. And I thought, I wanted to go on a submarine. I wanted to be on the Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. And I wanted to go white water rafting on the Snake River. And I'll never forget. And I wanted to make a whole one. I wanted to learn how to do magic. And I wanted to play the greatest golf course in the world. And I wanted to go to the White House for dinner. And I wanted to see the Pope. And I wanted to go to Pompalona and run with the bulls with a slower person. <laughs> And I'm writing them down. I had 107 of them. My wife come home. I said, honey, here's 107 of them. We're going to do every one of those suckers. And she looked at them and she said, gee, that's great, honey. She said, but why don't you get a job? So we made it 108. And now those 108, we've done 102. I know what it's like to come out of an airplane at 10,000 feet. Free fall 5,000 feet in 45 seconds. Pull the chute and fall the other 5,000 feet in seven and a half minutes. Ain't never going to do it again. <laughs> but every time I go up in an airplane, I, I remember what it was like when they opened that door and I could hear the wind howling, the engines roaring, and I remember the three guys that pushed me out. <laughs> and I've gone whitewater rafting on the snake river. I've done everything I mentioned except run with the bulls. See, ladies and gentlemen, don't go through life and be a spectator. Be a participant. Dreams make things happen. Don't make the mistake I made. I made a lot of mistakes. I don't regret them. Let me tell you what I do. I went to the University of Notre Dame. We took programs on the bottom. We took it to the very top. And for nine straight years, we won a January 1 bowl. Sugar, or went, went to a January 1 bowl. Sugar, cotton, orange, or fiesta. Nobody in the history of football had ever done that before. And I regret it. Dumbest thing I did was went to Notre Dame, took program on the bottom, took it to the top, and maintained it. See, ladies and gentlemen, when you try to maintain something, 
you violate the rule of law of life. The rule of life is this, you're either growing or you're dying. That tree's either growing or it's dying. That flower's either growing or dying. That person's either growing or dying and doesn't have a thing to do with chronological age. It has to do with dreams. The only thing you're going to change it from where you are today to where you'll be five years from now are the books you read, the people you meet, and the dreams you dream. See, ladies and gentlemen, the dumbest thing I did was we took Notre Dame to the top we maintained it. Anytime you maintain something, you never have an enthusiasm, you never have an excitement, you never have a reason to celebrate. You just go through every day and say, boy, I hope something doesn't go wrong today. No purpose. I thought I was tired of coaching. I wasn't tired of coaching. I was tired of maintaining. I went to the University of South Carolina, and our goal is to win a championship to win January one balls. I get up every day, I've got an excitement. And when I meet with our team, I will share them about the day I had today. See, I always think about how can we get there? How can we beat Florida? How can we beat Tennessee? How can we beat Georgia for the third year in a row? It's always on my mind. I got enthusiasm and excitement. I'm younger today than I've ever been because I know where I want to go. And remember the word win. Win stands for what's important. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I've seen people change their lives because they have a dream. When I went to South Carolina, I'd give the players a questionnaire. What do you like to do? I like to sleep. I like to do video games. But now when we talk about setting a dream, do you realize we have 12 players from last year going to the NFL this year? 12. Because that became a dream, and you ask yourself every day, what's important now? How do I get there? What do I have to do? See, don't put limitations on yourself. It's amazing what we can do if we believe in ourselves. See, there are too many people in this world that don't have the self-confidence, so they don't want to dream big. Most people are so insecure, they want to pull everybody else down. I used to be insanely jealous of my wife. Maybe you fall in this category. See, I don't like the way I look. And I used to get tired of people mimicking the way I look. In 1988, we're 10-0. We play Southern Cal. They're 10-0 number two. We beat them 27-10. Going to win the national championship. Go to Disneyland next day. They take a picture of our captives with Mickey Mouse, Donald Duck. They asked ask me to pose for a picture. I get in there on my right, they put Pluto, and on my left, they put Goofy. And I thought it was different, weird, didn't say anything, just pulled down my Notre Dame hat. Why am I upset? Because you get out the LA Times on Monday after Thanksgiving, 1988, my picture's in there. And that didn't bother me, but what bothered me was the sentence that said, here's Lou Holtz, head football coach of Notre Dame's Fighting Irish at Disneyland with Pluto and Goofy. Now, that didn't bother me. But the next sentence was in bold capital letters that jumped out at you. It said, Lou Holtz is a one in the middle. You don't need that. It's not necessary. And it's things like that that make you think, gee, I don't like it. Well, I used to be insanely jealous of my wife. And in 41 years of marriage, never once has my wife given me reason to be jealous of her. The problem wasn't with my wife, the problem was with me. We go to a cocktail party, she'd be talking to another man. He's always better looking, better built, more intelligent. And I think, gee, why wouldn't she rather be with him than with me? And all the way home, I would unfairly criticize my wife, trying to pull her self-confidence down to she'd reach a level where she would think she was lucky to have me as a husband. See, ladies and gentlemen, it's a problem. To be a dreamer, you've got to believe in yourself and your future and be willing to work at it. But then it brings me to the last point. And that's building a team. Building a team, and I want to say this, the most important thing in building a team is getting people to believe. And I only have three simple rules. And this is what winning's every day. Now, most people thought when I got out of high school, they were willing to bet that I would never even read a book, let alone write one. But the whole purpose of that book is just three rules. I just ask you to do three things. That's all I ask our football team to do, all I ask our children to do, all I ask myself to do. And I guarantee you do three things. Your self-image, your self-confidence will grow. Rule number one is just what I call do right rule. Do what's right and avoid what's wrong. And if you have any doubt, get out the Bible. I think it's right to be honest, right to be on time, it's right to be loyal. 
I think it's wrong to practice sexism, racism, spousal abuse. If we would just stop and do what's right, then we won't have some of the problems we have in this country with Enron, with different businesses. We wouldn't have some of the problems if people would just stop and do the right thing. And the second rule we have is do everything to the best of your ability. I admire Michael Jordan. I love Michael Jordan. He's a friend of mine. Not a close friend, but I played golf with him, been invited to his tournament. But I admire Michael Jordan because I was at Notre Dame the whole time he was with the Chicago Bulls. First game of the NBA season, last game of the NBA playoff, Michael Jordan played the same way. He had a standard. See, no matter what Michael did, he tried to do it to the best of his ability. You see, ladies and gentlemen, there's so many people who just want to go through and do things average. I played the golf tournament with Michael Jordan. It was for the Jimmy Valvano Cancer Fund. And after we're sitting around in the VIP room and Michael Jordan's here, I'm here. Tubby Smith, the coach at Kentucky, was there. Digger Phelps, the former coach of the Notre Dame Fighting Irish, was there. An NBA All-Star was there and some other coaches. And Michael Jordan said to me in a voice loud enough for the NBA All-Star, he said, Lou, he will never win a championship like us. Now, this is a friend of Michael's. Michael wasn't trying to hurt him. Michael was trying to help him. Then the NBA All-Star said, how can you say that? Michael said, how many pounds overweight are you? The guy said, 30. But he said, it doesn't matter because we're in a lockout. This was two years ago, three years ago this coming fall when they had lockout. He said, it doesn't matter, we're in a lockout. As soon as they settle the contract, I'll get in shape. Michael Jordan said, that's what I'm talking about. He said, if you want to be a champion, you don't wait for camp to start. And Michael looked at me and said, you're an NBA All-Star. I played with you in the Olympics. You're a great basketball player. But you can do that alone. He said, you can't win a championship alone. He said, you must inspire other people by the way you do things. You think about the people Michael Jordan won a championship with. Good Lord, no, John Paxson, Kerr. Luke Longley, but he inspired him. He believed in him, and he set a standard. What he did not let do, he did not let a few negative people on the team say, I don't want to do that. Well, well, you do your own thing, that's up to you. Who am I to pass judge? That's not Michael. Michael got confrontational because Michael knew to succeed. There had to be one philosophy, and that's everybody does it to the best of their ability. Because to do anything else. And when I went to South Carolina, it was sort of like, well, he does drugs, but that's up to him. I'm not going to do it. But who am I to pass judgment? Nonsense. We're all in this thing together. we got to be able to count on one another. And then the last rule I have is show people you care. Just show them you care. It's not complicated. See, why is it important to do what's right? Because everybody you meet asks three questions. If you listen to nothing else I say, I said a prayer before I come out here, I ask God to help me explain the way I feel. To get people to understand what I'm trying to say. Everybody you meet the rest of your life asks three questions. I don't care whether you're here in Florida or whether you're in New York or whether you're in Europe or Africa or Japan. Everybody you meet asks three questions. First question everybody asks, can I trust you? That's what the customers ask, can I trust IP's products? That's what the management wants to know, can they trust you? My wife wants to know, can I trust her, can she trust me? We've been married 41 years because of one reason, she can trust me and I can trust her. See, all relationships starts with trust. When people trust you, they respect you, and they respect you, you respect yourself, you respect yourself, you respect others. And why is it important to do what's right? Because if you do what's right, people can always trust you. My first year in South Carolina, after we won 0-11, you know the problem? They didn't trust one another. They knew that. Why? Because not enough people did the right thing. So there was no trust on our team. You come to our practice field, we got a monument this big, completely blank. Because when players start voicing their opinion that a lot of players on this team, we can't trust we wrote down everything we didn't like about ourselves and we went out on the practice field the next day and 
dug a hole and buried it, and I put that tomb. Said, "You come here, you'll see it." Our players know why it's there. It means you can change. It means no matter what you've done in the past, you can change. But what is important? Everything starts with trust. The second question everybody asks: Are you committed to excellence? I want to tell you when I have my staff meeting next Monday. We start practice, or we start our meetings next Monday. My season starts Monday. When I walk into that staff meeting, I'll be better prepared than any staff member on my staff. I got great coaches. My son's a great coach. Charlie Strong's a great guy. I got a great staff. I'll be better prepared than anybody on my staff. Why? Because I'll tell you why. If I walk into that staff meeting and I'm not prepared better than they are, they're going to say, "Hey, coach, you have a good time down in. Have a good time this summer." Did you have a good time down there in Panama City? Did you have a good time down there where, with the plant? Did you visit with it? Did you play golf? See, you can have all the messages you want in the world. First will be best, then will be first. But you send a message whether you're committed to excellence by the standard you have. See, ladies and gentlemen, you send a message the standard you have by how well you do things the best of your ability. Everything that goes out of that plant, every piece of wood, sends a message whether you're committed to excellence by the standard, by the caliber, how well you do things. And let me tell you something. Else. It only takes one person to foul something up. Tell you a true story, and I'm getting ready to run down here shortly. I was at Notre Dame, and I, I met Mr. Sims the day he had on his Notre Dame shirt, and he has on his Notre Dame tattoo, and I, I, I tell you. It was nice visiting with them, and I, I really enjoyed the people. I joked with them, et cetera. But I couldn't help but think when we played Stanford, coached by Bill Walsh, we're ahead sixteen nothing, and we get beat. Oh, I was devastated. I couldn't sleep. I couldn't eat, and I went home. And I came to this conclusion: the reason we lost, true story, the reason we lost was I let our players start being mediocre instead of being demanding. See, when our players come back 15 years from now, they'll tell a lot of crazy, insane stories about Lou Holtz. But I want to tell you one thing they'll never say. But if Coach Holtz knew how hard we were willing to work or what price we were willing to pay, we could have been great. See, I believe in people. And I went back on Monday and I said, I tell you right now, I'm going to be the meanest sucker in this world. And if I'm murdered, the police won't even investigate it because all of you will be a suspect. And we went out to practice and I had an All-American guard, Aaron Taylor. Played many years in the NFL, was injured, and in his place was a second-string left guard. And it didn't take very long into practice to realize the second-string left guard was going through the motions. I was always going, and his man made every play. The other ten guys are busting their hearts with nothing to show for it. I got irate. I went up to him. I said, "What gives you the right?" To jeopardize your teammates' chance of success, you don't have that right. Explain to your teammates why you're letting them down. If you want to fail yourself, you can do that. You don't have the right to cause other people to fail. I believe that. Harry Truman said, "The freedom to swing your fist ends where the other guy's nose begins. Your freedom to do your own thing ends where your obligation to your fellow human being begins." People said, "What's the difference between athletes today and 25 years ago? Today, everybody wants to talk about their rights and privileges. My right, my privilege. 25 years ago, people talked about their obligations and responsibilities. And that's a point I wanted to get across to that team member. He had an obligation to the rest of the team. We were all failing because he didn't take it serious. And I said, go over on the sideline, think about it. Third string left guard jumped in his place, and I was so mad, hadn't played. I said, no." Going to play with ten. Got in the huddle. We broke the huddle. And we have the center, a vacant area, and the left tackle. And that's when I was proud of our defense. They recognized it. Go, don't have a left guard. And I said, I know. They said, What do we do? I said, Act like we have one. Rick Myers, the quarterback. Jerome Bettis, the fullback. Reggie Brooks, the tailback. Rick Meyer takes the ball, gives the ball to Reggie Brooks, tailback. Oliver Gibson with the Cincinnati Bengals comes through the vacant left guard. Hits Reggie Brooks. As soon as he gets the ball. Whack! There's a moment of silence, and Reggie started to holler, "I can't see!" and scares you. Turned his helmet around; he was fine, and <laughs> came back to the huddle, and the players are complaining. 
I ignored it, ran another play, same result. After the third play, had open rebellion. I said, what's wrong? What's wrong? We don't have a left guard. I said, when did you know that? They looked at it. I said, well, three plays ago. I said, we haven't had a left guard all day. I said, I'm tired of pretenders. I'm tired of imposters. I said, gentlemen, we got beat by Stanford because we played with eight players and three imposters. I'd rather have played with eight. Oh, we would have got beat with eight. But at least everybody knows we only had eight. They would have said, gee, if we had 11 like them, nobody beat us. Don't be an imposter. We never lost again for 17 straight games. Our final five games, we played nationally ranked teams. We beat them on the average at 21 points. In the Cotton Bowl, we played Texas A&M, 12-0, number two in the country. The year before, Florida State played them in the Cotton Bowl, and I think beat them 6-2 to two or something. We played that same football team a year later, number two in the country, we beat them 28-3. to three. See, ladies and gentlemen, it's just a matter of understanding the obligation we have to other people. And the last question everybody asks, do you care about me? That's all people want to know. And that's what you're saying, do you care? See, ladies and gentlemen, too many of us evaluate somebody based on the way they look, the way they dress, the music they like, the church they go to. How blessed we are. Get to know people. We have very successful people here. And golly, you can't get any higher than George and Bill and have all kinds of successful coaches and successful people. But there's not one person in this room, Lou Holtz included. I don't care where it go, this beautiful young lady and this young man, that young lady, you're never going to meet anybody again that doesn't have a problem. That doesn't need a kind word, doesn't need a smile, doesn't need encouragement. I got all kinds of problems I worry about. But you know what? The best way to do it is to genuinely reach out and get to know other people. How lucky we are to have the opportunity, the talent, and the ability. I did International Special Olympics. I was a hugger. I had lane three. Whoever finished the race, first, last, or in between. My only job is to run up and say, I love you and how proud I am. That's all they wanted to hear. See, ladies and gentlemen, what turned the football team around was our players got to know one another. They got to understand everything about each other. That's all caring about is. And if you care about somebody, you won't let them down. If you care about somebody, you'll encourage them. And if you care about somebody, you won't let them go along and be mediocre. You'll encourage them to be better. See, that's the whole basis of our program. Do what's right, do the best you can, show people you care. Now, one of my goals was to learn how to do magic. I fool around with magic a little bit, and I'd like to do a simple little trick for you. I hope it'll work. It's like any other newspaper. You have front page for people who want to read the news. You have the comics for people who can't read. You have the editorial page for people who can't think. But what I'd like you to do for me is this. I want you to take two people. Take somebody you admire, love, and respect. Can be anybody in this world. And take somebody you got a problem with. Put these three questions on both people, simple yes or no. Can you trust them? Yes or no. Are they committed to excellence? Yes or no. Do they care about you and the organization? Yes or no. I guarantee. The person you admire and respect, you just said yes to all three questions. person you've got a problem with, you pinpointed the problem. Either you can't trust them, they aren't committed, or they don't care. See, it really isn't magic in how you do things. But you just have to have that faith and that belief. Now, somebody... I wake up middle of the night screaming because I can't figure that out either. It <laughs> bothers my mind. But, ladies and gentlemen, that's how the trust and commitment care. And those are the five things I believe in. Attitudes of choice is the most important choice we make. And you aren't going to find happiness in a job or an environment. It's a decision you make. Number two is a passion to win means get rid of all the excuses. It means sacrifice, get rid of the excuses. And fundamentals, number three, understand what you're trying to do. 
You're not running a machine, you're not looking at a computer, you're trying to satisfy the needs of the customer. And point number four, be a dreamer. I suggest if you don't have dreams, to write them down and don't go through life and be a spectator. But above all, the core values is to do what's right, always do the best you can, always show people you care. Because when they put those three questions, that answers it. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. I didn't come here to preach to you. I came here because I'm talking to myself about what we have to do at the University of South Carolina. And I'm going to tell you, we will make a run at that championship this year. And if you run into Coach Zook up at the University of Florida that I have a lot of respect for, you tell him we're coming down there in November. And if he plans on beating us, you tell him he better bring his lunch because it's going to be a whole day's work. He ain't going to do it a half a day. I want you to know that. But I leave you this. When I was at Notre Dame, we went over to Dublin, Ireland to play a football game. And when we were over in Dublin, Ireland, I felt we need to do some different things. So I took them to see a monastery built in the 12th century. We got there, and there's nothing but dilapidated walls and a huge cemetery. And at that cemetery, a young defensive lineman, Alton Maiden from Dallas, Texas, who ironically scored a touchdown that week by picking up a fumble, wrote a poem at the cemetery titled The Dash. Now, I didn't know he wrote it at the cemetery, but we always had a football luncheon and three athletes would get up and talk about their experience at Notre Dame. For example, Craig Hendrick, who still kicks in the NFL, got up in front of 3,000 people. and Instead of talking about his experience at Notre Dame, he goes into a tirade about how unfair Coach Holtz is to kickers. He said, Coach Holtz doesn't appreciate kickers. He said, do you know we're the only school in America that travels with one kicker and three priests? And the sucker wouldn't let go. And he kept going on, oh, everybody else traveled with three kickers. No, we only have one. I don't have anybody to talk to, but we got three priests. And the sucker just kept, when he sat down, I finally got up and I looked at him. I said, Craig, if it is true, we travel with one kicker and three priests, but I want you to understand, if you kick better, we'd only need to travel with one priest, you know. <laughs> but it was that type of environment. And Alton Maiden gets up and he reads this poem titled The Dash. And it said, I've seen death stare at me with my own eyes the way many cannot know. I've seen death take a lot of other people and left me here below. I've heard many mother cries, but death refused to hear. And in my life, I've seen a lot of faces filled with many, many tears. After death has come and gone, a tombstone sits for many to see. But it's no more than a symbol of a person's memory. Under the person's name, it read the date of birth, dash, and the date the person passed. The more I think about the tombstone, the only important thing is the dash. Yes, I see the name of the person, but that I might forget. I read the date of birth and death, but even that might not stick. But thinking about the person, I can't help to think about the dash, because that represents the person's life, and that will always last. So when you begin to charter your life, make sure you're on a positive path, because people may forget your birth and death. They'll never forget your dash. I thought that was pretty good advice by a 21-year-old defensive lineman. I challenge you to do two things. I challenge you, number one, to congratulate yourself on what you've done. I also challenge you to look at how you can get better, how you can improve, and how you can be significant. See, to be significant means you not only make yourself successful, you reach out and make others successful. Set a goal to make somebody successful because of you and the encouragement you give them. It's really been a pleasure to be here. I've already talked for an hour and eight minutes, but that's your fault. <laughs> if you got up moved around, I would have sat down a long time ago. But I just want to tell you, I, it was so good for me to be here. I really enjoyed myself thoroughly today. I look forward to pro following your progress. And remember, be significant. Thank you so much, and God bless you. Oh, sit down.